you kind of see the violence go down a little bit. These are just natural scientific facts. But what happens is, is that we take everyday stuff that God has done and we want to super spiritualize it and make it look like something different is going to happen to make ourselves look deep. Just shut up and preach. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> it's, it's simple. It's simple stuff. And people say, well, that's rude. No, we have a bunch of people that are in church every week and they're being brainwashed by foolishness. So you're going to take the moon. And I watched the guy. He says, I'm just waiting for people to come in and y'all sow a seed because God has revealed the eclipse. And I'm thinking like, well, if we get ready to die, I don't need to send you nothing. <laughs> that's sad. But no, before before we pray, I have to I have to, I told y'all I was going to make fun of. We had a dynamic time in South Carolina. We had fun in South, we had fun in South Carolina, but I'm going to pick on Miss Kayleen because Miss Kayleen was on her phone like she was single. <laughs> she was on her phone. We were trying to watch the Medea movie and I'm like, who is that? They're like, that's Miss Kayleen. Okay, well, where you at now? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm like, y'all tell her to be quiet. <laughs> we, the fellowship was fantastic. The food was fantastic. The worship was fantastic. They really had a good time. Uh, all of the reports that I received from South Carolina, everybody enjoyed it. And they're looking forward to us coming back next year. Amen. So next year, if we can pull it right for those who want to fly, ride the bus or whatever, uh, Miss Kayleen and her husband going to pay for it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. Let's... Uh, Let's, let's pray. Turn to God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour and all the things that you have done. Now, will God, open up our hearts and give us a word on today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have to give y'all one, th one more thing, though, before we get into this lesson, because I know folk are watching live. I did not know that Trustee Monroe knew how to sing. I'm listening to the radio, and I'm thinking it's Larry Graham and it's Trustee Monroe killing it. One in a million, he back there blowing. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Man, I was like, we might as well put him on CD. We could make some money off of this. <laughs> or, the, or, last, or last week we talked about, we asked the question, do you want to be, do you want to be made whole? Um, as a review, uh, we talked about last week, we said that healing can be sudden or seasonal and it depends on God and the person. So what I mean by that is, there are some people who know what needs to be done to be made whole. They know that it's a certain lifestyle that they should adapt to be made whole, but they don't want to be made whole because for some people being broken gets them attention. There are some people that do not, they do not want to be healed. We see them come in work. We see them come in church. How you doing today? God is good. I'm good, but my arthritis and my bursitis and my back and my neck and my son, I thought you said God was good, <laughs> but now you're giving me all this stuff. Are you giving me all this stuff because it's happening? Or are you giving me all this stuff because you need attention? Case in point, a baby, there's an experiment video that's going out in social media now. People are carrying their two, three-year-old toddlers. And what they do is a guy walked by the door. He hit his hand on the door. And he said, oh, baby, I'm so sorry. Baby's head ain't touched the door. After about 30 seconds, the baby starts to cry. Baby ain't hit his head on the door. But because the daddy hit the door with his hand and is giving the baby attention, the baby says, eh, no pain at all. That's what we do with adulthood. We know that if I come in and I tell people I'm hurt and I'm broken and Junebug is locked up, I'm going to get attention. If God is so good, then watch this. You need to live like God is good. Despite what you're going through, you need to live like God is good. Um, we also talked about many of us are voluntarily paralyzed. And this is just a review from last week. Many of us are voluntarily paralyzed. We know we should be moving. We know that we should be doing stuff, but because we would rather stay in our comfort zone. Comfort zone. The Ku Klux Klan, if they had their way, they would still be hanging us. That's their comfort zone. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When eight track tapes went away, people went crazy. What we going to do now about our music? 
And they came out with the cassette tape and the cassette, they were like, man, I don't like the cassette. I like my eight track. I told y'all last week about my aunt and the floor model television. She swears that that floor model TV was gonna be in that store. She found out they don't sell them anymore. Oftentimes when it's time to move, God will make it uncomfortable where you have no choice but to move. Um, a eagle, a eagle will take its babies and the eagle will put a baby on its back. The eagle will jump out of the nest, taking off at about 100 miles an hour. When the eagle jumps out of the nest, takes off 100 miles an hour, she turns to the side, the baby falls. And when the baby falls, the mother just keeps on going. And eventually the mother comes back, gets the eagle on her back, raises her back up, goes even higher next time. Drops the baby off. Baby is falling. People are looking from the ground like, oh, the beagle's about to die. Mama grabs the baby, pulls it back up. Third, fourth, and fifth time, mama drops the eagle off. Finally, the eagle learns how to fly all by herself. You're going to have ups and downs and ups and downs until you learn how to fly. The problem is, for many of us, we don't want to learn how to fly. We want, people to we want people to carry us. I was talking with one of my brothers earlier today about how you have grown men who live in mama's basement. Don't cut the grass, don't buy groceries, don't pay electricity or nothing. And if mama was to put him out, man, my mama tripping. No, she's not tripping, she's teaching you how to fly. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, you, I, and I've heard people say, well, you know, you never know. If your son come back home, I have the Trinity piece. It's the resurrection. You got three days. You can visit for three days, and after that, you got to go. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's reality. Many people are paralyzed. They don't want to do it for themselves. I talked about about a year ago how you have people in New York that have two, $300,000 homes driving a $100,000 car, but they, instead of getting a job, they will go downtown New York with a cup and collect four, five, six hundred dollars a day, ride the train back to their car in Staten Island, change clothes, put their bum clothes in their Mercedes Benz and drive off and go home because they never learned how to fly. Many of us are stuck in one spot. We talked about the man that was at the pool. The man at the pool made excuses. Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? He says, well, every time I'm coming, somebody jumped in front of me. Jesus bypasses his excuse. Write that down. Stop making excuses. <laughs> Stop making excuses. Jesus bypasses his excuse and he says, get up, take up thy bed and what? Walk. In other words, quit talking about what used to be. Quit talking about what happened. Quit talking about how it should be. Get up, quit making excuses. Put your big boy underwear on and grow up. <laughs> that's, that's reality. You, you have to get to the point where you stop making excuses. You have to get out of your uh, paralysis by taking the first step. So, so when we talk about uh, being made whole, there are many people whose lives are not whole and complete because their life is out of order. Write that word down, order, if it's not written on your sheet, order, order. Um, in, in the process of being made whole, you got to learn how to put your life in, compl in complete order. And order is lining up with what God wants and not what you want. You all remember about six months ago, we talked about how if it hasn't been approved in heaven, it's not gonna happen on earth. We talked about the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, where? On earth as it what? Is in heaven. So if heaven hasn't said yes, you can work 100 jobs, it ain't gonna happen. If heaven hasn't approved it when you're walking, when you're walking in God. So you have to understand, write this down, your will must match his will. Your will must match his will. If your will don't match his will, you can pray, dance, I can anoint you with chicken grease, whatever, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> because your will has to match his will. Does he, does, he, does he want that for you? Because oftentimes we pray for stuff that we're not able to handle. And I know that sounds crazy, but you hear people talk about God, just bless me, what, last week, just bless me to hit the $1 billion. If you're not faithful with $100, what make you think you're going to manage $1 billion? <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's, you know, that, but that, 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 that's a sad reality. So when we talk about your life being in order, when you reach a certain age, your life should be in order. But if it is not in order, um, there's four things. Number one, 
um, if your life is not in order. Number one, maybe you've never been educated on order. Maybe nobody ever pulled you to the side and said, you're not supposed to do this, you're not supposed to do that. That's one thing that's missing in the neighborhood. We don't tell these young kids that what you're doing is wrong. So if you're born into poverty and your dad is dealing dope and your mom is selling her body and that's all you've ever seen, you're gonna think that's normal, but in reality, that's out of order. Does that make sense? That some people have never been educated on what's right and what's wrong, which is why we try our best to minister to as many kids as we possibly can to give them a sense of hope to let them know what is right and what's wrong. Second reason why people may not necessarily have their life in order because of life issues. Life, man, life issues. Family, marriage, divorce, any, 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 anything can happen to cause your life to completely get out of order. When I was married the first time, uh, I was married for <laughs> probably four months. I thought I knew what I was doing in my 20s. I had absolutely no clue what I was doing in my 20s. I didn't know, Brother McIntyre. I had no clue. So what happened uh, is because of, what, because of how everything spiraled, I stopped talking. I didn't talk probably for about close to two months. And the issue was I had dental issues going on, but I was so mad at myself for making the choices that I made. I'm like, you know what? So I went to the doctor like two days before the divorce and uh, I had bad wisdom teeth. Like literally all of my wisdom teeth were messed up. Brother Monroe, they tried to schedule me. He's like, well, we can get this one out this week. And I was like, no, 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 take all of them out at the same time. You serious? Take all of them out at the same time. That way I would be healed, but also that way I would not cuss everybody out in court because I had court in two days. Mouth was shut. So <laughs> I went through all of this. I get in court and I'm beating myself up because I'm like, I can't believe that I was this stupid because sometimes God has to get you out of a situation in order for you to look back and be like, you mean to tell me, like, go back to your high school sweetheart. Think about the person you had a crush on in high school. And then think about that first reunion you went to after high school and you saw that crush. He was like, oh, what in the world was I thinking about? Praise God, we didn't hook up. Thank you, Jesus. I, I'm, say, I'm saying this because life for me at that time was spun out of order. I had to put everything literally back together. But here it is. Life happens sometimes. Sometimes you're going to have ups. Sometimes you're going to have downs. Situations are going to happen. But the question is, what are you going to do with the facts? We know we know the church stuff to say. I'm going through right now, but weeping may endure for a night. But you're, okay, I heard you. But what are you going to do with the facts when you get evicted, when they take your car, when you get divorced and they take everything? What are you going to literally do with the facts? Life issues happen that causes people's lives to be out of order. Number three reason why people's lives may be out of order, because you blew chances when you knew better. <laughs> you blew chances when you knew better. Everybody told you, don't mess with him. He crazy. She's a stalker. <laughs> She'll key your car. True life story. <laughs> Sister Miller, they said, Marv, don't do it. Man, what's wrong with her? She fine. Bro, she crazy. She done key cars. She done did this and this and this. And dudes didn't do nothing. Man, forget y'all. Man, I ain't worried about You know, when you're young, you think you got it all together. I'm thinking, I know I'm good, so she ain't going to be thinking about none of that. I'm going to take her mind off of it. Man, listen, when I say my car had everything happen to it except catch on fire, <laughs> and I knew better, but I still did it anyway because I thought that I was Superman. I thought I was a Teflon Don. I'm like, oh, she going to get over all of that because I'm this and I'm that. Man, listen, when you blow chances on your own, notice, I didn't say anything that God sent you. I'm saying stuff that you took a chance and did it on your own. So by show of hands, how many of your parents told you the right thing to do, but when you left home, you did the opposite? <laughs> You, mama, don't do this. Don't, if you do this, if you do this, not, man, mama, oh, she don't know what she's talking about. Then when it happened, you like, man, my parents tried to tell me, but I didn't get it. <laughs> and then fourth reason why life may be out of order, it's a combination of all three. It's a combination of all three. Maybe you didn't have the right childhood. Maybe there was some life issues that happened that you never recovered from. Maybe you made some choices that you never recovered from. But for any reason, Many of our lives um, are out of order. So let's look, on, let's look on the handout. 
I, I put that definition in uh, so we can get a clear understanding. Order is a condition that results from the logical, methodical, and comprehensive arrangement of components that are usually separated. I'm going to go through that in just a second. But the key words are logical, methodical, and comprehensive. So let's deal with the logical part. When we talk about your life being in order, logical, write this down, just makes sense. It just makes sense. But in 2024, common sense ain't common no more. It's some, man, listen, there are some people who have mental illness. There are some people who struggle at trying to make, you know, the right decisions. But there are some people that just know better. They just don't care. And it doesn't make, log it doesn't make logical sense at all. I try, I'm trying my best to still adapt to the area. And I have road rage. So because I have road rage, Verdell, when people are driving and I'm behind them, you got cars parked on one side, you got cars parked on the other side. I understand one car blocking the traffic to go in the house, but you still got a little bit of way to get through. But when one car going this way, another one going this way, and they want to stop and talk in the middle of the road, the old me is like, if you don't get your blessed assurance out the road, that... <laughs> Because it doesn't make logical, it doesn't make logical sense. Why stop and block traffic on both sides of the road? Get their phone number and talk to them later. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? Common sense, common sense stuff, logical. But we're no longer thinking logically anymore like we used to. Back in the day, logical sense made sense where when you walked into the church, you respected the church. You did everything that they told you to do because you respected the house. You respected God. Now in 2024, and I just watched this this past Sunday at another church. Cat walks in church with a hat on. Okay, brother, remove your hat. Then he got a full thing of coffee. Like church is the movie theater. Like I got this coffee. Br bruh, we in church. Like what are you doing? So then when you tell them you can't do that, they get mad and say, well, I ain't coming back to church. Okay, so when the bailiff tell you shut up and put it away, you'll do it. But when we tell you here, we just supposed to understand that doesn't make logical sense. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when we talk about logical, logical blends in with the next one, which is methodical. This is in the definition. Methodical, where there is a system or strategy. And we're just talking about order. I just want to give a, a lay groundwork for order. There is a system or there is a strategy for order. And then finally, it is comprehensive. That means that everybody understands it. And I'm going to tell y'all and I'm going to show y'all what I mean by all three. When it is comprehensive, that means everybody understands it. So when I talk about logical, methodical, and comprehensive, I want to use this in the preaching piece. So when I preach, I'm going to make sense. Well, Verdell, I try my best to make sense, you know. <laughs> I'm going to make as much sense as I possibly can. That's the logical part of preaching. The methodical part of preaching is when I start a sermon with a story, a movie, music, life scenarios, parables, or whatever, because I literally use that particular method to draw you in. That's my method. That's my method of delivery. I used to be an old school preacher and I found out that I was putting people to sleep. <laughs> Giving honor and reverence to God. And I'm thinking like, why am I trying to sound like Martin Luther King and I don't sound like Martin Luther King? So when I teach young preachers all across the country, I tell them, be yourself. The method that you use is being yourself. If I talk to you and you sound like Mike Tyson, but when you get on the microphone, you sound like Martin Luther King. There's a problem. You're trying to be somebody that you're not. Martin been gone a long time. Be you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And then in the preaching moment, comprehensive. So when I preach or I teach or when you're trying to explain God, you should be able to explain it so simply that everybody comprehends and they understand. That's how life is supposed to be. With life in general, the stuff that you do should simply make sense. The method that you do it, to simply make sense. And then everybody should be able to understand why you're doing what you do. But here it is. If you're the only one that understands it, it's not order. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you're the only one that understands it, that's not order. Because in 2024, the day and age in which we live, we're so backwards. Listen, 
uh, the rapper Sexy Red, again, the educators tried to bring her into a school. I don't believe the educators should have been fired, but I believe they should have been reprimanded. Sexy Red is the girl who raps Pound Town with a bunch of vulgarities in it. So she gets to the school, and when she gets to the school, and this is what we mean by order and logic and common sense, she gets to the school high as a kite. I'm not talking about high schoolers. I'm talking about fifth graders. She shows up high. They're like, well, ma'am, we wanted to bring you, but we're not going to allow them. That's number one. Number two, when she showed up, she showed up dressed like she was about to give it up for a Whopper and a movie ticket. Because you could see everything. I'm not saying that to be evil. If nobody ever tells you that you're wrong, you're going to think that you're right. I get it that you're famous and you're a star and you make your money from shaking your tail. But to walk into a school with fifth graders dressed like a hooker, that's not logical. So when they sensed that she had been smoking weed and got high, they told her that she could not speak to the kids. And then she gets on top of her limousine when the kids are getting on the bus and starts twerking. Now, to people with common sense, we say, oh, my God, have mercy. But to people whose mind is out of order, what's wrong with that? It's a whole bunch wrong with that. But we don't think logically anymore. So she gets on, and I watched it on my TikTok. She went live. Uh, they, they stopped me from giving the word of the day to the kids. If you hire a kite dressed like a hooker and all you do is twerk, there's nothing that you could ever tell my child. Ever. People, that's judgment. No, that's logic. That's common sense. Would you take your child to a person that is addicted to crack and tell the person that's addicted to crack, can you explain Psalms 23 and they're high as a kite and just got through getting high? They'd be like, no, I don't want them talking to my child because he ain't in his right mind. Same concept. But because we don't think logically anymore, the stuff that used to be bad is now good. The stuff that's good is now bad. So when you say certain things about logical thinking, people say, oh, well, you're just phobic. No, it's logic. I put up a post a couple days ago. Y'all know I like making folk mad. That's what I do. Uh, and I said, my daughter is trying to get on the wrestling team at Cardinal O'Hara. And I said, if my daughter's going to wrestle, she's going to wrestle girls. If they put her up to wrestle a dude, I'm going to have a problem. I don't care how he identifies. I don't want no grown, beard-having, testosterone-packing dude trying to identify as a woman to wrestle my daughter who was born a woman. When you say stuff like that, people say, oh, he's just phobic. No, that's common sense. You know, that's real. That's being real. Because if she's 16 and she's a heavyweight version and he's 18 and he want to act stupid on the mat, I'm no longer Pastor Barner. I'm that fool that identifies as a murderer. Because what you're not going to do is put your hands on my daughter and that crazy after she didn't drop you. She's good like that. You know what I mean? I'm saying that because in these days and times, we don't think logically. And then when you think opposite of what they think is logic, you're labeled. You're talked about. You're drugged through the mud. My thing is common sense ain't common like it used to be. And that's sad that we've come to, we, that's sad that, we've come to that point. So here it is. Um, when it is natural order... It is visibly seen. So if I took a drill and myself, Brother Monroe and Brother Verdell and Brother McIntyre, if we took drills and we took the pews up and we put the pews facing this way before y'all came in, y'all would say, why are the pews like that? Because common sense says that's out of order. That's why I say that common sense is not as common as it, as, as it used to be. So when we talk about order, if everybody sees it, and comprehends it, it naturally falls. Okay, I'm gonna get y'all with something and let's see if y'all see if y'all follow along. Um, if you go to McDonald's, there's a version of drink. There's small, then what? Then what? Okay, I'm making sure we're in the right place. Okay, with your bed, it's a twin, full or double, queen, king, that's order. But if I said that we started off with a twin and we automatically went to a king, that's not order. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? So again, when it's common sense, if per, and write this down, a person's mind that's out of order will always be in disorder. <laughs> a person's mind that is out of order will always be in disorder. <laughs> a person's mind that is out of order will always be in disorder. And make no mistake, 
Disorderly people will never like order. <laughs> never. When things are done the way they should be, the Bible says, try the spirit by the spirit. You naturally know because the Holy Ghost reveals it to you. But there are people that walk around that are consistently out of order. I don't want to deal with inside church, but I am. But I also deal with the home and everywhere else we go. Everywhere you go, and what's the old saying? There's always that one person. Always that one person. We're going to wear blue Sunday. Why we got to wear blue? How come we can't wear pink? There's always that one person. The sky sure is pretty. Yeah, but it's a couple of clouds over there. It's always one. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm not saying that to be evil. And you, you, you hear people say, well, that's just an opinion. No, sometimes with certain individuals, they take pride being disorderly. Watch, because disorderly gets them attention. How many business meetings have y'all been to in the last 50 years where it seemed like the whole church was on one accord? And somebody stood up and said, well, <laughs> and you knew immediately when they said, well, you're like, oh, God, they about to say something stupid. I know they're going to say something real stupid, but I'm just going to pray and I'm going to sing to myself because eventually I know they're going to say. And then when they stand up, they say something stupid. You're like, what is the problem? I'm saying this because Paul says when I would do good, evil is always present. So when we talk about order, when the day of Pentecost had come, the Bible says that they were on one accord. What happens when the church gets on one accord? But the main reason why many churches are not on one accord is because you have people that are not in spiritual order. How can you handle God's business? How can you handle God's things if you don't have God's mind? That's why the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So you have to think like God. But if you're thinking like yourself, you've already you've already failed. <laughs> don't y'all look, don't y'all cut me when we leave outside. So so here it is. Um, the issue where we get out of order and write this down is we confuse man's order and God's order. We confuse we confuse man's order and God's order. And we're going to get to Genesis in a little bit. We confuse man's order and God's order. 90%, 90 percent or more of life being out of order for many of us, whether, no, whether you're young, whether you're older, whether you're seasoned or what have you, is because you tried to mix your way with God's way. And here's the thing. When you try to mix your way with God's way, it's visible. It's, vi it's visible. Okay, let me, let me contemporize this because we got people watching live. Uh, when you mix brown liquor and white liquor, you're going to make yourself sick. You <laughs> said you're going to kill somebody. When you mix brown liquor and white liquor, you're going to make yourself real sick. You're going to be confused. You're going to be dizzy. You're going to be sick to the stomach. You're going to make some horrible choices. When you try to straddle the fence and mix the nightclub with church, acting a fool in the street with Sunday school and doing all that other stuff, and then wonder, I don't understand why there's chaos all around me, because you're straddling the fence. You're dangerous. Y'all see how quiet it got? That vein right there. That vein right there. <laughs> that vein right there. Because we think that I can do the God thing on Sunday. We weren't here Sunday, but I bet you it was a whole bunch of people here. Why? Because we've been taught Sunday is communion. So first Sunday, I'm going to come, I'm going to put on all the church stuff. I'm going to walk in and say, hey, how y'all doing, Brother Curtis? Hi, hey, thank you. Hallelujah. Hey, God. Second, third, fourth Sunday, we don't see you because you've been groomed and taught out of order that as long as you show up, and take communion, you can do whatever you want to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But another reason why there's a lot of people in church Sunday is because they heard about the eclipse. So if I did something wrong, let me try to go one day to get all of my last 35, 40 years corrected <laughs> or doing what I want to do. So let me pull up in church. Don't believe me? Y'all remember 9-11? When 9-11 happened, that following Sunday, everybody and their mama was in church. Packed. Because they thought that if planes is falling from the sky, it must be the end of the world. So for the next four or five weeks, 
and church. Oh, God, whatever it is that I did, forgive me. All the people I slept with, all the stuff I smoked, God, in the name of Jesus. And then it was like, wait a minute. It's been all this time, and the world ain't ended yet. Guess I'll go back out and do what I was doing. And that's what happens every single week in church. We want to mix the two. We want to mix the two. Would you allow your husband, boyfriend, or girlfriend to go out and kiss one of your best friends and then come home and kiss you? You <laughs> she said he ain't coming home. <laughs> so the thing is, we we cheat on God, but because we can't see God, we don't think that we're cheating on God. Mm. So with your mark with your partner, you be like, oh well, let me I ain't gonna go over there because she over there. Let me go to this club. I'm gonna do it. Yeah, it's easy to hide from there, but you can't hide from God. But because you can't see Him, you figure that you can do whatever you want to do. David says, I went up and you were there. I went down low, and you were there. I went into hell, and you was right. He's right. He's everywhere. But because we can't see him, we don't have fear of him. Don't believe me? Okay. By show of hands, when y'all was growing up, how many of your parents told you not to lie? <laughs> okay, put your hands down. All right. By show of hands, how many of your parents told you not to drink? <laughs> Only put hands down. How many parents told you not to get high and do stuff that was illegal? But as soon as you got out the house, well, my mama said that I can't, I can't lie. So you probably haven't lied, but you done participated in some stuff that wasn't godly. So we tested the water. Mama said, if you tell a lie, God going to get you. When you ate 9, 10, 11, 12, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. As soon as you hit about 18, you tell that little white lie. And we say, I ain't told no lie. If you told your children there's a Santa Claus, you lied. <laughs> Easter Bunny, you lied. And then when you told the lie, you said, God ain't, ooh, he ain't killed me. I'm just going to keep on doing it. And that's what we do outside the church. God ain't killed me like they said he was going to kill me. So I'm going to keep on doing all the stuff that I'm doing until the stuff that I'm doing turns on me. Now I got to come back into the building where I talked about Miss Val. I talked about the ushers. I talked about Miss Barb. I talked about Sister Miller. I talked about Brother Monroe because them shallow folk ain't nothing. But now that life is kicking me in my tail, I got to humble myself, climb the steps, walk back in and act like I ain't said no dirty stuff to them people. And then when they call for the doors of the church to be open, I'm going to come up and I'm going to snot and I'm going to sob. I do not doubt that their heart may be sincere, but here it is. It ain't how high you jump in church is how straight you walk when you leave. And that's the problem because we've mastered the art of coming in, going through the motions. That's my brown liquor. <laughs> and then when I get outside, I jump on the phone and start talking about the people that was in church. That's my white liquor. And now Monday night, I'm going to happy hour. That's my white liquor again. <laughs> Tuesday, I'm going to a birthday party where I know it ain't going to be nothing but a bunch of strippers and fools. That's my white liquor, yeah. And after a while, the two are going to blend and you're going to get sick and you're going to be so confused. And you're not going to know which way to go. That's why the Bible says, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, not the club and the casino and the Lord, not the strip club and the brothel and the Lord. We going to serve the Lord. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? And that's why for many of us, we are spiritually confused because I want to read my Bible, but my favorite TV show coming on. I want to go to church, but at, at uh, 1030, they having brunch and they're going to have mimosas. I want to <laughs> I want to go do this, but. I got, you know, I, I'm just saying this because I'm not telling you that you just have to be a robot and be in church all the time. But again, how many days in a year? 365. How many months in a year? 12. How many days of the week? Seven. How many hours in a day? So an hour on Wednesday, maybe two hours on Sunday and an hour in between for meetings or whatever. And you too busy. You not too busy. You just don't care about God. Man, it got quiet. We lie and we say, I'm just so busy. You got time to do everything else you want to do. Watch this because you love it. But when it comes to God, I'm just going to put God on the back burner. I'll go whenever. They'll miss me, but I'm okay. So people are comfortable disappearing for three Sundays and popping up like, hey, I'm here. How y'all doing? <laughs> faithful. Write that word down. Faithful. Faithful. <laughs> 
Because watch, God, when, you, when, when, when the rapture comes, he's not going to say, well done, thy part-time servant. He's not going to say, well done, thy you came once or twice a year servant. He's not going to say, well done, you was in an auxiliary, but you never showed up to usher servant. He's not going to show up and say, you showed up on the first Sunday, but you ain't show up no other Sunday servant. He's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We don't honor faithfulness no more. We just show up and do whatever. Mr. Val, don't I have to, do I have to uh, charge the ushers on Sunday? I sure do. I, I'm telling you now because you the head and I, okay, here's the thing. When it comes to ushers or any other auxiliary in the church, dues without determination and dedication don't mean nothing to God. I pay my dues, that's nice, but what have you done by way of dedication? Oh, it got quiet. I need security. This side right here, I need y'all to help me when I get ready to leave out. <laughs> I pay my dues, that's nice, but are you dedicated? When do we see you? We see you when it's time to march, but we don't see you when it's time to serve. Ooh, it got quiet. <laughs> but when it's time to serve or do something else, if I can't be seen, I want y'all get quiet on me now. I'm going to say the same thing on Sunday, so y'all just prepare yourselves. <laughs> Again, if you're not dedicated, are you showing up for God or are you just showing up to be seen because you got low self-esteem? And you need somebody to validate you. So because I'm here every Sunday, but I don't necessarily usher. But when the first Sunday come, I got to make sure that I got my shirt on. I got to make sure that my suit is tight. I got to make sure my girdle is here because they're going to be looking at me. So I need to make sure that I'm in front. That don't mean nothing if you're not dedicated. Write that word down, dedication. Dedication. Now, I'm going to need security from all y'all when I say that Sunday. <laughs> There, there, has, there, has to, there has to be a sense of dedication. So when we talk about putting things in order, what time is it? Okay. When we talk about putting things in order, there's an old saying, first things first. Let's go to Genesis. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. And if somebody would grab that. Now, if y'all say, I don't know where Genesis is, we're going to fight after. We're going to have a show enough fight. As soon as we get outside church, it's on site. Genesis, genes, where we get the word, genes, where we get the book of genes, your, your, your origins. Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, somebody read verse 1 and 2. So watch, let me give you a history in this. Let me give you a history in this. In the beginning, nobody was there with a pen and pencil and paper. I need y'all to remember what I'm telling y'all because a lot of times we just automatically, we say things like, well, I read it and I believe it and that settles it. You need to know why you're reading it. You need to know what happened as the reason why you're reading it. Moses wrote Genesis 900 years after creation. 900 years after creation, Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Moses wasn't even alive. So when you hear people say, well, in the beginning, da, 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 there was nobody there with a pen and paper. <laughs> this is stories that were revealed to Moses by the Holy Spirit and by God. So 900 years after creation, Moses writes the book of Genesis. Why would he choose Moses to write the book of Genesis? Because he was going to choose Moses to lead them into the promised land. But how can I lead you to a land when you don't know your history? So literally the word Genesis, genes, the beginning of history. So he's using that to give them their history. Now, by, from a theological aspect of the Bible, Job was the first book of the Bible, but because of how they put it together, it's Genesis. Another, another Bible study altogether, but if you look at Job, Chapter 1, verse 2, we see that chapter 2, verse 1, it says that the angels came to present themselves for angelic inspection, and Satan was in the midst of them. Job technically was the first book, but because of how they put the canon of Scripture together, they made it Genesis. Y'all understand that so far? Okay, don't cut me. So here it is. God gives Moses a vision 
that if I'm going to lead the people somewhere, they need to have a history of who they are and where they come from. Are you getting what I'm saying? So read verse one again, Verdell. You, <laughs> you good? Stop right there. Stop right there. Here is what the Bible is not saying. Notice it doesn't say in the beginning God was created. It says in the beginning God created. God is preexisting all by himself. So you hear people that don't believe in God and they say things like I don't believe in God because da da da. I believe in the Big Bang. Well, somebody had to create the Big Bang. You believe the Big Bang? That was God. <laughs> Whatever you want to believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So notice, Genesis is not the beginning of God. It is the beginning of where he started creating. Please, please do not miss that. So in order for him to create man eventually, he has to give man something to be with before he creates him. If he had just created Adam first, then Adam would have just been in the dark. But because he knows that he's getting ready to create Adam, he has to set an atmosphere for Adam to be able to function when he arrives. Does that make sense? Okay, let me, let, I'm going to say this again next week in part two, but let me give you another part. When you say that you're pregnant, uh, anybody in here pregnant? Right? No. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> all right. When you say that you are pregnant, in your mind, you're thinking, I have a life inside of me that is getting ready to come forth. I can't just bring the life out of me. I have to make sure that I set up an environment for the baby to be able to thrive. When it's a newborn baby, you don't put a newborn baby in a king size bed. But there are some people that have because they couldn't afford. I mean, you get what I'm saying? You put them in a bassinet. You put them in a crib. You don't go old school and take a twin sheet and cut it into squares and make diapers like they used to make back in the day. You set the environment for the baby. So when the baby comes, the baby has food, the baby has clothes, the baby has diapers, the baby has a place to stay, the baby has a place to lay his head. So God is not going to create Adam first. God has to make sure that he makes an environment where Adam can actually thrive. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm making sure, I'm making, I just want to make sure this makes sense. Read verse 2. Read verse 2. So watch. I'm looking at my time. So watch this. Notice what it says. The earth was without form, it was void, and it was dark. So let's deal with those three, and I'm going I'm to I'm I'm try to tie all this together. So... The earth was without form. Write this down. There was nothing there. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing there. It was a sea, just a mass of black. Only God could see. There was nothing there. So when it says without form, nothing. Number two, it says that it was void, meaning that even though you couldn't see anything, it was empty. Void means empty. There's nothing there. I can't see what's around me. That is without form. He had to put it in his hands to form it. Then it says void, which simply means empty. And then it says dark, which is what? An absence of light. When you meet people, there are some people who are without form and they're void, and that's why they're dark. <laughs> I'm going to get to that in a second. So think about this. You meet people that are without form. They have no vision. Go back to when we were 25, 26 years old. You didn't care if anybody had vision. You just wanted to have fun. You wanted to fall in love. You just wanted to enjoy life. But when you began to get older, you like, okay, do you have a plan for your life? Many people are without form. They don't have a plan. All they know is wake up, kick it, smoke, get drunk, go to bed. I did the exact same thing because I did not have a plan. I was without form. Don't miss that. But also... There are people who are void. People that are void have nothing to offer. And you ever notice that it's always the people who don't have anything to offer that have the most to say? You own three pairs of shoes, a church hat, and a Facebook account, and you always talking junk about people. Why are you talking if you have nothing to offer? I'm not saying that to be evil. Young women, if you're watching this video, when you run into men, vice versa, men, when you run into women, ask them those questions. What do you have to offer? Are you void? Are you without form? Okay, let me get deeper. What's your credit score? Are you getting what I'm saying? Do you have a plan to make me your wife? And if you do, what's the plan 20 years down the line? 
Do you have a plan of allowing me to be your husband? What's your plan to be my wife and vice versa? I'm saying this because we've been taught to just go into something and build as you go. No. And many of us were in relationships years ago where we thought that was what you were supposed to do. But aren't you glad y'all split up? <laughs> so without form, no vision, void, nothing to offer. And finally, dark. Sadly, there's just some evil people running around the planet. I'm not saying that to be judgmental. I'm saying that because we have some evil people that are run. I, I, I looked at a post the other day and I did a tag on it with Caitlin Clark and uh, they were talking about how uh, Dawn Staley led five, you know, led her team, you know, to an undefeated season. They beat this girl and the focus was on Caitlin Clark. So people were commenting on it and this one gentleman, and I can't say what I want to say because we online and we, this one gentleman, uh, he jumps on, he jumps on it. And when he jumps on it, he says, well, it's about time we beat the monkeys out of their own game. And I'm like, wow, dude, you need a nap. That's number, you need a nap. But I'm like, sir, I was like, why would you refer as monkeys? These are young ladies who play basketball. Well, the thing about it, the, uh, you monkeys have been this and that, this and that, this and that. And I was just like, sir, I was like, nobody's insulting. We're just talking about the sport. This is he and I interacting online. Well, I'm just telling you, you monkeys this and you monkeys that. So after a while, I'm thinking I got choices. I can just walk away, which I know I can't just walk away because I grew up in the South. Uh, so he just kept on talking and talking. I'm like, well, sir, we can just agree to disagree. Yeah, because that's what you monkeys do, da, da, da. So I just typed your mama like 20 times and I just jumped offline. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm, pa I'm, pa I'm, pa I'm past, I'm past the art of being humble when it comes to racists. I'm done with that. Y'all marched and got spat on, had dogs sicked on y'all, sang songs, and now we have people now that are y'all's age and my age that are older. Well, we need to go back to marching and singing. Clearly, it didn't do nothing the first time. It, did, it, was, good, it was good in theory, don't get me wrong, but now they still lynching us. It's still a bunch of the same stuff going on. So I have to tell my mom, and y'all pray because I know my mom is why, Marvin, you gonna mess around and get killed. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna get killed. I'm just not gonna take what y'all took. I can't do that because you think it's bad now. 20 years from now, it's gonna be real bad. I hate to say it that way. And if you know who gets in office, it's gonna be terrible because he has the power right now that they have given him to get locked up because he keeps trying to push the trial back, but he still has a possibility of going through the election locked up. And as he's locked up, pardoning himself for being locked up and then coming after everybody who actually locked him up. He has visibly said that that's what he was going to do. And you got people that look like us, oh, no, he wouldn't do that. I'm like, what type of are you? <laughs> I, I, and, and the thing is, I have no, I have no, I have no respect. I have no words. I'm going to love you because the Bible says we're supposed to love each other. But I got family members that are like, well, you're voting for such and such. I'm voting. I'm like, bro, you ain't got to say nothing else to me until I die. You showed me who you were when all of this was going on. And people say, well, it's not about black and white. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And watch. You'll hear people say, well, how come we can't just talk about peace and humanity? We've been saying that since 1619. When are y'all going to say it? Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's why I, that's somebody asked me the question about elections, why I would not let politicians come and stand in the pulpit. I don't need a Caucasian politician coming to the church and saying he hates racism. Don't tell our congregation. Go tell yours. Go tell them because them the ones. <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? That's, there are some evil people who do not care about humanity. And that's where we are now. Think about all the crime and stuff that's going on. Up in New York, the migrants that they pumped into the city, now they're being violent towards people because they brought them in and was giving them money. Now some of the sources are cut off and they're robbing people, breaking into people's houses and doing whatever. New York is an hour and a half from here. I, 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 you hear what I'm saying? I need y'all to think. New York City is an hour and a half from here. There are some evil people that do not care. So when we talk about order and dealing with substance, dealing with form, dealing with voidness, when we talk about order, uh, this should be on your sheet. Number one, you got to learn how to survey your surroundings. Man, survey your surroundings. Um, I'm looking at my time. Uh, if you're... 
surroundings are jacked up, then chances are your life is out of order. Uh, God says, I can't put Adam in a dark, void, formless environment because if I give him eyes, he's not going to have anything to see. <laughs> so I have to create something, an environment that he's able to uh, define. Uh, Chester, Wilmington, Philadelphia, if there were no buildings and no roads and no nothing, it would be without form and there would be a bunch of confusion. So God has to set the environment correctly before he even thinks about making man. Watch this. Um, write this down. Your environment must match what you want. Your environment, your environment must match what you want. And huh, if the environment does not match what you want, or the environment is out of order, chances are it's going to make you sick. And I'm going to show you, and I'm going to show you how about, and I'm using this from a physical sense, but we can also correlate this with a spiritual sense as well. One of my favorite TV shows, and don't y'all judge me, one of my favorite TV shows is Hoarders. I watch Hoarders just to see what people have in their homes. Snicker bars, Gatorade, raw chicken, dead mice, wigs, tires. I'm surprised they didn't pull out no dead bodies in some of these houses. But <laughs> she said they have. But and notice hoarders, hoarders is a illness. It is a mental illness because if somebody comes in one of those homes and tries to take at least a, a thing of yarn, they go crazy because they in their mind feel that they need that. Watch, I'm about to get you with a drive-by. Many of us are like that with people. We have people in our lives that we have hoarded and gathered together. And if that one person who's killing us decides to walk away, we know they're killing us, but because they become a part of us, we try to pull them back in and keep them. So in hoarders, in the physical show, many of them, because their environment is messed up, they're sick. If you look at all of those, there's a few hundred episodes of hoarders. If you look at every individual that's a hoarder in their house, number one, we know they're not clean. Number two, if you look at the conditions of their skin, they have psoriasis, they have all types of illnesses. Number three, the average one on the show smokes cigarettes, so they already have a lack of oxygen. Are you getting what I'm saying? So think about it this way. Inside the house, there are dead pets and dead things. That's airborne poison chemical spills that they've never cleaned up. That's airborne poison, germs and all types of stuff that's in the house consistently floating. That's the flu, that's emphysema, that's, a, that's literally a little bit of everything. But watch, because they're not willing to rearrange their environment. They are, are sick, but they don't know that they're sick. So when they bring a professional in to try to come and clean out the house, I don't want you to move my stuff because the stuff has become part of them. Write that down. Stop keeping stuff attached to you that doesn't belong. Stop keeping stuff and people <laughs> that are not, stop keeping them attached to you because here it is, many people are sick and they really don't know they're sick. And their sickness is because of their environment. Here it is. Have you found yourself mad for no reason? hurt for no reason, anxiety popping up out of the blue, nervous for some strange reason, worried about all this other stuff that you can't control. If you're feeling that stuff on a regular every day or every other day, chances are the environment around you is making you sick. Who is it that you are attached to that keeps bringing drama to your life? Who is it that you are attached to that you have to consistently worry about all the time. And I want to pour into every mother and every grandmother, every father and grandfather. You raise your child the best that you could. You use what you had for the time that you had. They are no longer your responsibility. I know that's a hard pill to swallow because you think that I got to help. If you die tonight, who going to help them? You did the best that you could with what God gave you. Do not beat yourself up because you. a lot of times what happens is when our children make bad choices, we automatically beat ourselves up. No, you can't beat you up. You gave them the tools that they needed. But when they became grown, they made those choices. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
But what happens is, is that for mothers, grandmothers, fathers, grandfathers, we get into this, oh my God, what could I have done better? I should have done this. You did everything that you were supposed to do with the power that you had. You cannot beat yourself up. I got a son that's in prison. He's supposed to get out in six months. When he first got locked up as a dad, oh, I should have done this when I did this. I should have did this when I did this. Why didn't I do this? Why? It had nothing, that didn't have nothing to do. He made the choice that he made. So because my surroundings, I was worrying myself to death. I was figuring out how am I going to protect him? How am I going to be able to do this? God is like, bruh, he's in prison. He got to protect himself. You did the best that you could for the time that you had. Now you got to leave it on me to protect him. And I give you all the same thing. You got to leave it on God to protect them. You can't beat yourself up. So when we talk about the environment, uh, and write this down, write this down. This is, a, this is an interrogative. This is a question. Who is fueling your environment? <coughs> Excuse me. Who is fueling your environment? Who is fueling your environment? God gave Adam lungs because it was meant for him to breathe. But considering the earth is mostly water, he could have gave him gills, but he gave him lungs to breathe because that's how he was going to function. He created an environment ahead of time so that Adam would be able to function correctly in the environment. And you would be surprised of the stuff. I just got through talking um, to one of my good friends today, and I've been looking for um, dandelions. Dandelions. Listen, let me tell you all something. True story. I went six months without taking my heart medicine. And naturally, in our mind, we think, you didn't take your medicine? Because the doctor tells us to take medicine, because mama told us that we need to take medicine, and so on. A lot of our medicine is medicine. A lot of the medicine is placebos. I don't know if y'all know what that is. It's a pill that looks like it'll help you, but you thinking that it's helping, it's not doing anything. I drank dandelion tea for six months. Never took my heart medicine. I'm in the gym running like I'm 25 years old, and I'm thinking like, God, wait a minute. What's going on here? <laughs> I'm saying, I'm, 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 I'm saying this because in my environment, I have a choice. I can take pills for the rest of my life, and then as I get older, now eventually I'm going to have kidney functions because that's what it does. No matter what medicine you take, if you take enough of it in a certain dose at a certain amount of time, as you get older, the medicine was fixing my body, but now I got to go to dialysis because that medicine ran through my kidneys 40, 50 years. I'm trying to completely rearrange my environment because my heart attack was caused by the vaccine, the vaccine that I took. It was proven. So when they put the stents in my heart, he's like, okay, well, these blood thinners, da 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 And I'm thinking, like, I'm not going to take medicine the rest of my life. I'm not doing that. And here's how I got the clue. Y'all remember when I had my hip replacement last year? They told me, you got to go seven days without taking your blood thinner like seven days it takes 48 hours for it to get out your system but seven days I'm scared to death I'm sweating like a slave in the house I'm like man I'm in this parsonage I ain't taking this medicine for deal and I'm like if I don't take it on the fourth day I don't know what might happen seven straight days I did not take it then I had the surgery and I went another five days and I'm like wait a minute I went 12 days without this and I'm thinking in my head like okay so what's my environment gonna be saturated in so what I did was I got kids that don't pick dandelions. I took dandelions, cut off the stem, boiled them, got the dirt and stuff off, filtered them through a coffee filter, added honey and a little bit of cinnamon. I drank it for like six months. I said, you know what? I have a choice. I'm 53. As I get older, I can control my environment. Here's the thing. We don't think we can control our environment. We allow other people to try to control our environment. I'm not telling you stop taking your medicine. Don't y'all try to sue me. Don't try to sue me. I stopped taking my medicine and my ear fell off and I blame the pastor. No, don't, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. All I'm saying is, is that for my environment, I have a choice. Am I going to take all these pills for the rest of my life? Or am I, watch this, going to go back to God's original environment and take natural remedies? Because guess what? They work. No matter how we try to paint it, they work. That's why Dr. Sebi ended up getting killed because he gave out natural remedies advice. Dick Gregory told y'all years ago, if you don't eat certain foods, as you saw, he lost the weight, he was in shape, and he died a natural. We have to be careful, but here it is. I'm not telling you all to match my environment. I just know what I'm doing in my environment. I have to survey and say, what is it that could possibly hold me down and make me sick? It's the medicine. Now, 
in your heads now, you're thinking, oh, Reverend, be careful because the doc, because your mind has been trained for the last 60, 70 years to think that the doctor said, and that's what it is. I know what that doctor said, but I also know what this doctor said too. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you learn how to lean and depend on God, the Holy Spirit will direct you. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And again, I use that as a disclaimer. Don't go home talking about, I ain't going to take my medicine, and then you can't see tomorrow. Don't do that with me. Don't. <laughs> Sister Ernestine, you better take your medicine. Don't be trying to get me in trouble. 